The Tom Woods Show, episode 1576. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, social media is a pit of misinformation when it comes to the subject of guns. So what you need is my free ebook, Your Facebook Friends Are Wrong About Guns. Smashes all the myths and a lot of fun to read. Pick it up at wrongaboutguns.com. Hi, everybody. Tom Woods here. Well, we've got rather a provocative topic today with our guest, Jason Brennan. He is the author, among other books, of When All Else Fails, The Ethics of Resistance to State Injustice. And we're going to be talking about precisely that, about resisting the state using force and when that's justified and talk about all kinds of interesting moral questions and interesting practical situations, but without giving practical advice. Again, I want to make clear, we're not saying you should do this in this situation. The question is, is it morally available to you to do this sort of thing? Jason Brennan is Robert J. and Elizabeth Flanagan Family Chair and Associate Professor of Strategy, Economics, Ethics, and Public Policy at the McDonough School of Business and by courtesy Associate Professor of Philosophy at Georgetown University, formerly Assistant Professor of Philosophy Research at Brown University, and holds his PhD in philosophy from the University of Arizona. Jason, welcome back. Great. Thanks for having me again. Good to talk to you again. All right. Look, this is a uh, Crazy controversial book. Let me just say a couple things before we get started. There will be some tough guy libertarians out there who will say, well, I mean, I already knew all this. Yeah, we can resist if we want to. Okay, well, first of all, what you have here is a philosophically rigorous defense of that position. That's one reason this is significant. Second reason it's significant, it's published by Princeton University Press. I mean, that's no small accomplishment. But as we were just noting before we started, you were saying Princeton has been rather brave in taking on controversial topics, not only topics that you've covered, but I know Brian Kaplan has published with Princeton and not always topics you would associate with an Ivy League institution. So it seems like there's something, but also Cambridge. I've seen a number of our people publish controversial books with Cambridge University Press as well. Yeah, I think uh, Princeton in particular, they have a number of really high quality editors that recognize their job is to push novel ideas that are rigorously defended. And it doesn't matter what the content of those ideas is. It matters how good the arguments are for them. So yeah, I've had nothing but support personally from my editor, Rob Tempio. You know, he reached out to me originally, and that's why I'm involved with them. And yep, they published a book of mine criticizing democracy, saying that it's uh, a false god. They've published a book of mine uh, arguing that most people shouldn't vote. And, and now this. Um, and again, Brian Kaplan has the case against education plus uh, the myth of the rational voter with them as well. Well, it's outstanding. I, I, I couldn't be happier about this. So why this particular book at this particular moment? Was there anything that happened maybe in the news or anything, any anecdote from your personal life that can help us understand why you said, doggone it, I need to make this particular point to the world of philosophy and to the world at large at this moment? Yeah, uh, I think it's Facebook really helps a lot with this because I'm constantly looking. At, I don't search the news, but I belong to a number of Facebook groups that will pick out certain kinds of items on the news. And what we see constantly are stories about American police officers using overwhelming violence in silly situations. So we all know about Eric Gardner being choked to death and having his chest crushed, but that's a relatively mild case compared to some of the things that I saw. You can go online and watch videos of people being pulled over for routine traffic stops and the cops just beating the crap out of people and almost killing them, or someone getting into a car accident and the cop coming out and shooting them. And at the same time, we have things like Snowden, who's trying to whistleblow on the NSA and saying that they're stealing certain kinds of information they shouldn't have access to. Plus, we're seeing just omnipresent war. of The U.S. Is, empire is constantly making war everywhere. And we know that a large percentage of the people that are killed by, say, drone strikes are just innocents. So I started wondering, well, what are we allowed to do in response to all these horrible things that we're seeing? You know, most people say things like, obviously, if you could assassinate Stalin or Hitler – um, back in the 1930s, it'd be totally permissible to do so. But I started wondering, well, if a cop tries to arrest you for smoking marijuana, do you have to submit or are you allowed to resist him? That's an unjust law. So are you allowed to resist or you have to just take it? Now, let's 
take this opportunity to clarify something that you clarify right at the beginning of the book. You're not giving people advice about particular situations. You're not discussing the advisability of resisting in a particular situation. And it's not a question of prudence because sometimes you may have a perfect moral right to do something, but doing that thing may be highly imprudent. That's a separate matter, assessing the pluses and minuses of action in a particular situation. The question is the abstract issue of would I be morally to blame if I resisted in this case? Yeah, that's absolutely right. Um, a good analogy for this would be, imagine that you're on the playground in middle school and I'm bullying you. And just suppose I'm a lot bigger than you and I have a lot of friends with me. So it might very well be imprudent for you to stand up for yourself because it could just be that we're bigger and stronger and there's more of us and we're going to beat you up and you're standing up for yourself will simply mean you get hurt. But at the same time, you obviously have the right to do so. It would be permissible for you to fight back. You don't owe it to us not to fight back. So sometimes the government might be like that, where you know if you say resist a police officer arresting you for something that shouldn't be a crime, then what will happen is they'll simply kill you. Or if you've managed to resist that police officer, they'll send more police officers after you, maybe even a SWAT team. So it could be deeply imprudent for you to defend yourself, but nevertheless, it's permissible to. It's morally right. You have the right to do so. One of the issues that arises in assessing questions like this is that the general public thinks differently about the state from the way the tiny sliver of us who think of ourselves as libertarians or radical libertarians think about the state. And you also note this because you give examples of stories of cases where anybody would agree this is an aggressor you have the right to resist. But as soon as you replace those aggressors with uniformed state agents, suddenly everything becomes murky. People want to side with the state agents now. And this becomes – this makes it difficult – to assess situations uh, morally. So I don't know how, I mean, I don't know how you solve that problem, but what you're doing in this book is arguing for a moral parity among people, that we shouldn't have this presumption that state agents have some kind of special privilege or that when they're engaged in beating the hell out of somebody, this is somehow not as bad as if somebody else beat the hell out of somebody. We just don't have any – this is the sense in which libertarians are the most egalitarian, is that we are not respecters of offices. Yeah, that's absolutely right, and I, I refer to it as the idea that governments are almost magical, a force field around them that somehow privileges them and allows them to be immune from the more normal moral constraints that all of us face. So one thing I do in the book is I give about 26 or so examples of parallel cases where I describe a private civilian doing something wrong. And then ask, uh, according to your own intuitions, would it be permissible for someone to resist even violently in this situation? And basically everyone says yes. And we run some radical pacifists who think you can't use violence ever. Aside from them, they all say yes. And then I give what on its face looks like a parallel case involving um, government officials acting in their capacity of office and say, this looks like it's exactly the same thing. So what do you think about this? And suddenly people go, I'm not so sure. And, uh, you know, some of the cases I give, like, one of the cases is just you're sitting in the park and all of a sudden a person comes out and starts shooting at the children are you, and you happen to have a gun. Are you allowed to shoot him? And everyone says yes. And then I can give cases like a real life case. This is actually taken. I mean, almost all the cases I use in this book are actually news stories. They're not made up. Uh, so you're, you're, you see like someone pull a cop pull over a minivan and there are children in it and he immediately starts shooting at the minivan and you have a gun. Can you shoot the cop? A lot of people will say no. Surprisingly, quite a few people will say yes there. But then you can give them other cases and they'll – they'll suddenly switch over. You know, so you can think about, imagine I'm at your party and I get really drunk and I start causing a ruckus and then everyone subdues me because I'm making, I'm, I'm being violent. I should be subdued. But then after they subdue me, they continue to attack me and pummel me long after I'm subdued to the point where I'm almost dying. Everyone would think, all right, you can stop them from murdering this person. Like it was okay to subdue him, but you can't continue to beat him once he's subdued. But then if you give them the exact same story, but it's the Rodney King beating, then suddenly they think, well, maybe it's okay. Maybe he's permitted to resist. If I say, like, I, I happen to believe that caffeine is really bad for you. So if I see you drinking coffee, I'm going to lock you in my basement for 30 days. You're allowed to kill me to stop that from happening. But if I tell the exact same story, but the government has outlawed caffeine, they go, well, I guess you have to submit to it. So what I have to do here is say, why would we believe that? Um, so the, there, there's this idea that for some reason or other that the conditions under which you can resist government injustice are much more strongly or tightly controlled and much more strict 
the conditions under which you can resist um, violence and injustice from civilians. So that's called the special immunity thesis that for some reason, government agents have a special immunity against defensive action. You can't lie to them. You can't deceive them. You can't engage in subterfuge or sabotage, and you can't use resisting violence to stop them from doing injustice, at least not maybe only in very extreme cases. So what I want to argue in the book is that, no, they're on par with everybody else. The conditions under which you, the listener, are allowed to use violence, subterfuge, deceit, sabotage, and so on to resist my injustice are exactly the same conditions under which you can resist government injustice. But in order to make that argument, I have to basically do is go through dozens of arguments that people would give for the other side in behalf of the idea that government agents have special immunity and try to show that these arguments don't work. Right, because what people will say is that it's not the same th- – like, for example, um, Michael Humer is one of the kings of analogies, I think. Uh, he gives a case, and I'm sure his version is more sophisticated. But it was something like you go out for drinks with your friends, and obviously your friends outnumber you. So they decide at the end that you're going to pay for the drinks because they voted. Now, everybody says that's not right. I mean, you know, Just because there are eight of you and one of me doesn't mean I should have to pay for the drinks. But if this were a democratic state – and eight people voted that you're paying for the drink. You're paying for them. And he's saying this is really not different. But for some people, it is different because they would say the state is legitimate in some way. That yeah. The state has had legitimacy conferred upon it, and that distinguishes them from us. Yeah, that's right. So one of the things I have to do in this book is – like the, chapter three is really about this idea that government has a special moral power to induce in us an obligation to obey – and the word – sometimes people refer to it as legitimacy. Sometimes they refer to it as authority. It's, there's not like a common uh, use of the words in philosophy. But this idea that like when government commands you, that creates an obligation in you to obey because they issued that command. So it's different from if I say, Tom, don't murder anybody. Well, you shouldn't murder people, but it, the fact that I told you not to has no force. It doesn't give you a reason not to. Whereas they think, no, when government orders you to do something, you acquire a reason not to do it simply because you were ordered. And so I, what I think I do in this book is I go through uh, some puzzles about that. And I say, even though the belief in government authority or legitimacy is very widespread, it's very common for people to think they have a duty to obey the law because it's the law. Surprisingly, the philosophy looking into this seems to show that there isn't. I mean, philosophers have been working, even though you know very few philosophers are libertarian and most of them are not anarchists. Nevertheless, it, it's almost a consensus view among people who work on this topic that there's not a good reason to believe in a duty to obey the law per se. Because there's like dozens and dozens of arguments that people have offered over the course of the last 2,500 years that are meant to show that government has authority, and they all seem to fail. You know, so like, and uh, we could go through some of them if we wanted to. But the other thing about that is, even if you can show that government has some kind of basic authority to make you pay your taxes for, say, public goods like the roads, or a basic authority to make you pay your taxes for like, the police or to require you to drive 55 miles an hour at a certain street as opposed to 70 miles an hour. If you can establish that it has the right to do these things, it doesn't follow that it has this just straight up right to force you to do everything else. You know, So th- there's like this extra burden that they face, which is you have to be able to show that government has the right to like force you to do things which are actually good and justified, but it's more strongly that it has the right to force you to submit to its own injustice. Right. So I said to people, like imagine you have in your hand a book and it's a new theory of government authority. And I haven't read it yet. I have no idea what it says, except I know that at the end of the book, you conclude the following. If the U.S. government unanimously votes to nuke the tiny night island nation state of Tuvalu for no reason at all, just because they feel like it, then they'd be permitted to do so. I would regard that having not read your book as a reductio of the book. It's saying like, well, s- something went wrong because that's absurd. Uh, so I kind of push that back to the uh, to the reader and say – Look, I, I go through a couple different theories of government authority. I can show that none of them really work. But even if you come up with some new theory, the extra burden you face is you have to not merely show that government has the right to exist and to do good things, but the right to exist and force other people to submit to evil things. Good luck with that. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. I want to flip back to the very first pages of the book because on pages 12 and 13, it's kind of like – when libertarians say, you know, we believe in defensive violence only and, you know, we don't think that you should engage in any other form of aggression against anybody, people say, well, yeah, I agree with that. That sounds right. But then as soon as we spell out the implications of that, people recoil. Whoa, 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 hold on a minute. Well, likewise, you have a section where you lay out about 10 different controversial claims that follow from 
the theory of the state and theory of, of uh, what's just that you're laying out. And it's not just that if I see a police officer engaged in what certainly appears to be unjustified aggression against somebody, I can help him. I can help the victim, or if I am the victim, I can resist. You go well beyond that, including questions of uh, people who are not observing a specific injustice, but who, let's say, want to infiltrate some department of the state to prevent the commission of further injustices. So can you give us a few examples of where what you're saying can lead to you know, again, fairly not controversial to maybe to the listening audience here, but generally controversial conclusions. Absolutely. So, I mean, the list includes things like it's permissible to assassinate presidents or representatives or generals if you know that they're going to start or engage in an unjust war, even if doing so simply delays the war for a few weeks. You're still permitted to do it. Uh, you can resist unjust uh, arrest for any kind of unjust law. If, it, if it's criminalized and shouldn't be criminalized, you have no obligation to submit. And if you are imprisoned, you have the right to fight your way out of prison and even kill the people that are there to stop to get out. You can, I think political candidates can lie to ignorant voters to stop them from uh, voting for the wrong person and, and implementing an unjust law. I think corporations and businesses can lie about their compliance with wrongful or punitive regulations or wrongful or punitive taxes. Uh, I think you can join the military or a branch of government with the express intention of sabotaging the things that it does that are wrong. So you join the NSA and you do a Schindler's List kind of thing, and you mess up what they do and stop them from doing the wrong things. I think you can engage in tax evasion. If you're a soldier, you can disobey unjust orders. Um, you can also fight back against your superior officers if they try to force you to do so. Um, you can seal and publicize certain state secrets the way that Julian Assange or Edward Snowden or Chelsea Manning might have done. Uh, and even if you're a Supreme Court or other kind of justice, you can lie about the content of the law in order to produce a just outcome. You know, so just to give an example of the, the kind of case that I give there, I, I have this like thought experiment. I say, I might imagine that you are the world's best interpreter of Immanuel Kant, you know, a philosopher who is not known for his clarity of writing. And a bunch of people come up to you and they say, we are Immanuel Kant cultists and we're going to do whatever Immanuel Kant tells us to do. And they happen to be reading something where Kant uh, recommends infantis like infanticide, killing bastard children, which he actually does for some reason. I don't know how he came to that conclusion, but he insanely does. Uh, and they ask you, OK, so is it permissible for us to kill, um, you know, children born out of wedlock? Because we want to know that because Emmanuel Kant has a commentary on that. I think you're totally allowed to lie to those people and say, nope, he says he, that you're not allowed to because, you know, if you tell them the truth, they're just going to murder a bunch of children who don't deserve to be murdered. Well, similarly. If you're looking at the Constitution and it happens to legalize slavery and authorize and permit it, and then somebody asks you, does the Constitution permit slavery? And you know that if you tell the truth about what the Constitution says, which is that it does actually authorize it, then they're going to continue to enslave people. I think you can lie to them and say, no, nope, it doesn't. Uh, that's a misinterpretation. And in fact, it, it forbids slavery. So you, owe, you know, lying, lying and other kinds of defensive actions are like using violence and so on. All these things are by default wrongful, but they can be used in certain circumstances. And I think the common sense view that pretty much everybody has is something like this. You can engage in deceit, violence, sabotage, and other sorts of defensive action just in case uh, some sort of aggressor is about to commit a serious injustice or cause serious harm, and it's necessary to stop them. The question is then, why think the state is any different? Why not apply exactly the same standards to the state? Well, let me ask you something that's not directly taken from the book, but that raises the same kind of question, because I wrote about it in my email newsletter the other day, and that has to do with the fact that I've been called for jury duty. Now, do you favor jury nullification? Oh, absolutely. Um, okay, and I, I, I so my question would be, <laughs> well, let me give you, uh, let me tell you what happened to me the last time I was called for jury duty. Because Generally, I'm called, and then the day of, I call into the system, and they say they don't need me. So only last year did I ever have it be the case that I called in and they said, you have to come in. So I'd never come in before. So I'm waiting in that room and then they called my group into the courtroom and the judge, who was a nice enough fellow, but he treated us like we were seven and was explaining to us what was expected of us. He asked a question and doggone it, I, Jason, I cannot remember the wording. I wish I could because it was a question that you would have had to be a lemming of the most shocking proportions to say yes to this question. But it was something like, would any of you have, well, I, no, I guess you'd have to be a lemming to say no. He says, would any of you have any problem following any instruction I might give you, but 
but it, but it was way worse than that, like way worse. And I'm so, even if I didn't know about jury nullification, I would have said, uh, yeah, I'd have a problem with that, right? <laughs> but, but, but it was something like, you know, basically if I tell you you have to rule a particular way because of the law or something, would anybody have any problem with that? So I raised my hand. Now, my view is if you have the time, it's probably a good idea to try to get on a jury because maybe somebody is being um, harassed over a victimless crime or being railroaded by the state one way or another. Maybe you can help that person, you know, but it so happens that this, the timing couldn't have been worse and I really, really wanted to be excused. So I was honest with him. I raised my hand and he wanted clarification. And I said, well, I believe juries may judge both the facts of the case and the law, which of course is the classic statement of jury nullification. And I said, I've been very public in saying this. So if if that were to come to light and cause problems for the case, that would make me unhappy. So I thought I would tell you. And all right, so then eventually they did dismiss me. So I've been called in again. And so I wrote about this in my newsletter and I've had people saying I should lie to the judge or I should simply not answer the question when I'm asked that. And so given that you've thought about this very deeply, what is your opinion of that situation? Yeah, I agree with what you did. I think I agree with your analysis too. Uh, I think I don't think you're typically obligated to defend other people from injustice. Um, it's often what we call a supererogatory action. It's praiseworthy. Right. No, I agree. You know, it's not yeah. an obligation, but it's just a good thing if, if you're in a position where you can do it. Yeah. yeah, I agree. Yeah. And I think it's if you are in that position, though, then unless there's some sort of harm that would come to you, I think you're obligated to actually engage in this. So it's one thing if it's one thing if uh, like, let's say you're in the jury and you're voting right now. And in fact, the person did possess 10 ounces of cocaine or what I guess it's a lot of cocaine. That'd be expensive. He, he possesses a lot of cocaine. He, in fact, broke the law. And you're already on the jury and you're about to vote. I think you are obligated to vote not guilty in that situation. Like you have to. And if the judge calls you in and says, are you engaging in jury nullification? You simply smile and say, I simply don't believe that the state has proven its case. And that's totally fine. The judge has it coming. It's it's lying to the judge is like lying to the murderer at the door. The classic case of people come to your door and say, uh, we think you're hiding some Jews upstairs and we're going to murder them because we're Nazi Stasi guard, like we're Nazi guards. Uh, do you have any Jews? You're allowed to lie to them. It's permissible to do so. And I think the judge is playing that same role in this situation. So sure, I'd, I'd recommend lying to him. And I think it's you'd be totally morally pure for doing so. Uh, now, in terms of like being prudent about it, there's a very good chance they're going to investigate you and see whether or not you've published things to the contrary, and they might simply dismiss you. Um, I wouldn't recommend saying something that could be held against you later, but you just say, I think he's not guilty and leave it at that. Okay. Yeah, I, I had a number of people, uh, even non-libertarians writing to me, like like just conservatives who aren't of the Newt Gingrich variety, you know, who at least have some creativity in their minds, <laughs> were saying – Given that the court itself has usurped this right of juries, you don't have any obligation to assist them in doing so, you know, by by treating them like they're honest actors. Uh, you shouldn't do that. All right. So I'm glad to. So then that's maybe what I'll what I'll try and do. Now, getting back to this, a lot of people will come back with these people like the police and, and other state officials. They're just following orders. And they're just doing their jobs. And that sounds so, for lack of a better word, boomer to me. <laughs> you know, they're just doing their jobs. But but you have taken that on. So how, so what, what would you say to somebody who says, well, you know, he may not like the law either, but what do you expect him to do? It's a strange thing that people use this as an argument because it sounds almost absurd when you describe, like, what they're really doing. So imagine I said – Okay, uh, like I decide to work for you. Like I'm gonna, I'm gonna become your new employee, and you say, "All right, I'm gonna, pay, Jay, I'm gonna pay you like ten thousand dollars a month plus health insurance and give you a pension if you do whatever I say." And then I'm like, "That sounds great." And you know, for the first couple of days, you have me like file books or something like that, and do some photo editing or whatnot. And then on day number five, you're like, "I need you to go uh, beat the crap out of that little kid over there," and then I go and do it. That would be absurd. Obviously, I wouldn't acquire an obligation or permission to do that simply because you ordered me to do it. And it'd be weird for me to say, oh, no, you don't understand. The reason I have to do it is because I promised to follow his commands in exchange for money. Like, that's not a justification. <laughs> it doesn't, doesn't sound very flattering when you yeah. put it that way. <laughs> and, and that's not how promises work. Uh, what, what a promise can do is you have a, a range of freedom, things you're permitted to do. And when you make a promise, you restrict that range. So I promise my wife you know, all the promises that come with marriage. One of the things I did was I took the range of women I'm allowed to sleep with and shrink it down to one. 
right? That's that's what happens in a marriage. Um, I have like now an obligation to like provide for her and do certain things to her that I wouldn't normally have. I, I restricted my freedom in that way in virtue of my promise keeping. But you don't, in virtue of making a promise, lose your prior obligations. So you have a pre-existing obligation to respect other people's rights, to treat them as ends in themselves, and to avoid harming them in certain ways. And you can't lose that right, that obligation simply because you make a promise to another person to do what they say. Yeah. So it's it's weird that people would think otherwise. You know, there's other art kind of arguments about following orders that are a little bit more sophisticated, where they say things like, Look, it might very well be that you think something is wrong, but your superiors, you have good reason to believe your superiors have superior knowledge to you, and so you should defer to them. And there are cases where that makes sense, but again, notice it's nothing special about government. We had strong reason to believe that like the zombie apocalypse virus is now widespread across the world, and in this sci-fi story, you are the scientist who's really good at identifying who has the zombie apocalypse virus. And you like yell at me, shoot that person right over there, right away. Well, you know, maybe I should defer to you because I have good reason to think you know whether that person's infected or not. We could imagine cases like that with the government where, you know, they know something is wrong or they know this, they have knowledge which makes something permissible. You have good reason to think they're telling the truth and that they know better than you. So that sometimes happens, but that's not special to government again. And at the same time, we also have good reason to think that governments often lie about this stuff. So you should be quite skeptical about their claims to superior knowledge. Before we wrap up, I, I do want to ask you to elaborate on something you mentioned that you cover at the end of the book, which has to do with the specific the, – the question of you, you as an individual. What are you morally obligated to do? And you were saying that you used the, the concept of something being supererogatory, which is, uh, which is something that Catholics would say, for example, is what describes what a monk does. Like a monk, or, or let's say a, a Franciscan friar, somebody who just goes from one place to another, not bound to any location, thinks of the entire world as his moral obligation. That's not what the average person is called to do because you have your own specific obligations. You have your own family. You have your, your own neighbors. You have enough in your immediate circle to keep you busy. And so, yes, it would be wonderful for you to help that suffering person in Switzerland, but that's not your... That's not strictly speaking an ob obligation that binds you. That might be admirable if you've satisfied your other obligations. So how do we how do we decide what falls into what category? Yeah, good. Um, so I, I, in that final chapter, I examined some arguments to try to push the claim that you have a, a positive duty to resist in like most cases. You know, so some of these arguments are things like. You would be complicit in injustice if uh, you didn't participate, but it's very implausible because it just makes it sound like simply in virtue of of living in a country, then you're complicit in everything the government does. That doesn't seem very plausible. Um, some arguments are the form they say, well, it will corrupt your soul in order to uh, to sort of witness injustice and do nothing about it, but that relies upon very convoluted psychological claims, which seem probably false. I think it's more plausible something like this. If you can stop an injustice at very low cost and very low risk to yourself, then it starts to sound more plausible that it's obligatory. But when it starts to be higher cost and take a lot of time and take a lot of effort and put a lot of risk on you, then it's more likely that it's supererogatory, that it's it's nice to do, it's admirable, but it goes above and beyond the call of duty. You know, so imagine in front of me right now, I have a button and I can just press it. It will take half a second to do so and it will cure world hunger and stop police violence, uh, excessive police violence for the rest of time. Well, I'd be a jerk for not pressing it. But that's very different from I see police officers beating the crap out of Rodney King and I decide to insert myself. In that case, there's, I'm taking upon a high risk of harm, of ruining my life and so on. So it might be heroic, but it's not something I owe. Okay, because that is somewhat relevant, obviously, to what you're talking about, because we, we're talking about resisting. And then the question becomes, at what point are we obligated to resist? Well, it's a very, very valuable book because I'm, you know, obviously there are people, I'm sure, in the anarchist or pacifist traditions who have written about this. That's not quite where you're coming from. Uh, um, you're coming from a place that's much more, I guess, familiar to the libertarian community, but you're conveying it in a way that I think appeals to the, you know, the unbiased moral instincts of the average person. So it's really quite an accomplishment. And then to have it published by Princeton, that is just the icing on the cake. So the book is When All Else Fails, The Ethics of Resistance to State Injustice. I'm linking to it on the show notes page for episode 1576. That's tomwoods.com slash 1576. Do you have a, a website or where you a place that you regularly contribute to that I can also link people to? 
Uh, I used to blog a lot on bleedingheartlibertarians.org, but I don't really do much of that anymore. Um, I think I think I'm just sort of more of a Facebook person at this point. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. Well, the the lesson will be read the book. Are you working on anything now that you can disclose to us? Yeah, I'm doing a few books. Uh, some are going to be debating uh, issues like libertarianism or capitalism or uh, democracy. Uh, there'll be a series of books published by Oxford on those debates. Uh, I have a, a work in progress about how would you be a good representative in, in government today, given that we have good reason to think that the typical representative has no clue what he's doing and further, neither do the voters. So how do you, how do you do your job as a, as a representative, given that you're probably an idiot who's incompetent? Uh, so that's one of the big projects. Most recently, I had a book come out that was all about uh, looking at the criminal justice system in the U.S. and why it's dysfunctional. So if you're interested in that, you can check it out. It's called Injustice for All, and it's a diagnosis of why the U.S. criminal justice system is so badly managed. Excellent. All right. Well, so I'll just remind people, When All Else Fails is the the book we've just discussed, and I'll link to your more recent book also at tomwoods.com, so 1576. Thanks again. Thanks so much. All right, folks, before we go for the weekend, let me tell you about one of my listeners who's an electrical engineer turned web developer. What he tries to do is make websites look and function like a million bucks and make them totally optimized for speed. Obviously, you want a really nice website, but you can get bogged down researching plugins and image optimization and website security and backups and downtime monitoring and troubleshooting. Just outsource your website development and maintenance, and you can do so and be very happy with Joe's Web Solutions. Joe'sWebSolutions.com slash Woods gives you an exclusive message for Tom Woods Show listeners that I know you'll enjoy. So head over to Joe'sWebSolutions.com slash Woods and get this important task accomplished by a fellow Tom Woods Show listener who delivers excellent results. I'll link to him also at tomwoods.com slash 1576. And my parting words to you, remember, this could be perhaps your weekend project. If you've been thinking about starting that website or blog, I've got some tutorials for you that'll help you along. I'll give you publicity like this for free on my show and some other stuff, including membership in my bloggers group. All these nice bonuses. All you gotta do is just get your web hosting through my link and you get all the details, and I'll even show you how to set it up in a quick little video I have for you. It's all covered at tomwoods.com slash publicity. On that page, I also link to where you can see all the sites that are still active that I have promoted over the years, so you can get a link to that as well through tomwoods.com slash publicity. All right, see you next week, everybody. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit tomwoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.